So we're going to be moving on to the next agenda item. We have curated a very special list of subject matter experts, stakeholders, and policymakers, led by a very efficient moderator for our first panel of today's event. The first panel is titled, Understanding Financial Exclusion in Nigeria, Research Insights, Nuanced Challenges, Opportunities, and Policy Imperatives. To moderate this panel, I'd like to invite the Inclusion for All Advocacy and Communications Lead at EFINA, Chinasa Collins Oburo. A round of applause for her, please, as she comes on stage. Thank you very much. Chinasa will be moderating a panel, and the panelists are Zayad Siga, PhD, who is the Executive Secretary, Kaduna State Residence Identity Management Agency, Kadrima. If we can have you up on stage, a round of applause for Zayad, please. <laughs> Joining Zayad and Chinasa, I'd like to invite Mary Ellen Iskenderian. She is the President and CEO of Women's World Banking. A round of applause for Mary Ellen, please. And our final, last but not least, panelist is Hawa Wakili. She's the head, Digital Services and Skills, Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC. A round of applause for her, please, as she comes to the stage. Okay, um, good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen in the room and our guests online. Um, I must say that it's an ex exciting time here because um, when I started to post this, um, the flyer for the event, a lot of people would reach out to me and were excitedly looking forward to this, including myself, just because, again, the A2F data has been what has informed a lot of the work I've been doing over the past two years around um, identity ownership for the excluded populations. As my friend Akadimo likes to say, permit me to stand on existing protocol at the risk of breaking it, because a lot of people have been standing on the existing protocols. Um, but welcome, very, um, very warm welcome to everyone, and more importantly to my eminent panelists. Um, it's an exciting session. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And I must confess that this wasn't deliberate. We have three women on this panel. I know that women are the most excluded groups, but we, it wasn't what informed this panel. We just were looking for um, people that would speak to the issues that we want to address. Um, before I go into the session and contextualize this conversation, when I was in the bank, earlier in my banking career, my boss would say, numbers don't lie, which is essentially referring to the fact that the fact is a fact, and irrespective of how you feel about it, you know, your numbers is what will basically tell you what the truth is. And it reminds me of a catchphrase that I recently came across um, by a well-known American conservative commentator and writer, Ben Shapiro, and I'll read it. It says, facts don't care about our feelings. And it caught my attention for two reasons. First, I thought it was quite a stoic statement, but then also very true. True in the sense that, as I mentioned earlier, a fact is a fact, and it doesn't matter how you feel about it. But then bringing this into the work that I do, you know, trying to advocate for policy changes, etc., you start to also think about feelings and facts, data and your emotions. And I usually like to introduce myself as an empath. I'm very passionate about things. If anybody knows me, they just know that Chinasa puts her feelings and her heart into anything. But I quickly also realized that the work that I do, my passion isn't enough, my feelings aren't enough. I do need the data. So Tommy has done a fantastic job of going through the data, which represents the facts, 
data is only as good as the, what it's used for. And imagine if none of us here cared at all about the people that we're targeting, then the data wouldn't make sense to you. The reason you're taking pictures is because you care. You're trying to solve for a problem, right? And so data is going to give you a greater, a clearer sense of how to proceed to solve that problem. I won't bore you with any of that anymore. And so to quickly contextualize this session, which I like to frame as a human-centered conversation, we've gone through a lot of data, you know, all those numbers, and then we've seen and heard from the people that we care about, the voices from the fields. And I have this fantastic panelists to just talk from their own lens and the work that they do about the nuanced challenges that some of these people are faced with, the opportunities that they can identify, and some of the policy imperatives that we can start to quickly think about based on the highlights of the findings. So the A2F data, the 2023 A2F data, has told us two things for the context of this conversation. One, that the priority segments such as women, youth, people in the northwest and northeast of Nigeria in rural communities who are likely to be farmers remain disproportionately excluded. We also know that the increase in inclusion has been significantly driven by non-bank channels, heavily reliant on technology and mobile network connectivity. And so you see the financial service agents extending access to over 11 million Nigerian adults who do not use the bank or mobile money. And so this conversation will do three things mainly to first understand the newest challenges, newest challenges the people we care about are faced with through their lens, as I mentioned earlier, to explore the opportunities that can be leveraged for advancements of financial inclusion and also to recommend policy imperatives needed for continued action. And at the risk of being biased, I'm going to start with a woman. And um, <laughs> Zayed laughs. I'm starting with Mary Ellen, not just because she's a woman, but also to start from a global perspective. And um, in Mary Ellen's role as the global CEO of Women's World Banking, um, Mary, the first question to you is, given Women's World Banking's global focus on um, advancing women's financial inclusion, it's a two-part question. The first part is, what challenges and behavioral patterns are you seeing that women customers continue to face and how does it vary from rural to urban communities? That's the first part. The second part is, where do you see the most pressing opportunities for policymakers and FSPs, which is financial service providers in Nigeria? Janessa, thank you so much for the starting me off as the, uh, the panel lead and for having me here today. And congratulations to everyone in this room and the entire ecosystem for these really exciting results. I think they definitely point the way to success. But I'm also really honored that you've come to an organization so dedicated to women's financial inclusion because what I think these numbers also tell us and, and your dedication to facts um, really show us that we're not going to be able to reach those goals if we don't include women. And so you're absolutely asking the, the right questions. So at Women's World Banking, we are a global organization working throughout the global south. We did some work a few years ago thinking we were going to see very different barriers given different cultural issues, different types of countries, and we were really quite surprised to see how similar barriers and challenges are across geographies, across cultures, across different types of countries, and they, they tend to fall into three buckets, if you will. The first is, what are those challenges and barriers that the woman herself faces. And I think we saw this borne out in some of the, um, the Athena data that we just saw is that um, basic literacy, but particularly both digital and financial literacy are um, much less, um, you find much less amongst women. And even where they, they may have some of those basic skills or those basic skills at the same levels as men, they have much less confidence in using those skills. And I think the importance of both digital and financial, I think, is absolutely worth underscoring because we do see a gap in access to technology. So the technology um, access is another very big um, concern that we have. And again, it's it's not enough just to own that basic feature phone. As more and more of the 
financial services industry is designing for apps. And I do appreciate the, Tomei's calling us out to, to think about um, designing for feature phones. You know, I think uh, hi history is moving in the, uh, in the other direction um, towards app-developed uh, financial services. So getting smartphones into women's hands, making sure they have the confidence um, and the knowledge to navigate those phones and those products is, is, absolutely, um, is absolutely essential. The second big group of, uh, of barriers and challenges we see, which I think we'll talk about throughout the panel, is with financial service providers, who frankly, despite a lot of evidence to the contrary, some of it uh, very much at the the uh, origin of women's world banking, but but uh, other places as well. They still don't see a business case for serving women in general, but certainly not for serving low income and perhaps previously excluded women. Um, they just don't see this really as a viable customer se uh, segment, and a lot of that gets down to the fact that while they may collect data about women customers, they're not necessarily gender disaggregating the data all the way down to the product level, and they are certainly not using it when they're making decisions about product development, which segment to serve. We see consistently women as better repayers of loans, for example. But when you look at the data, they often get much smaller loans and many fewer loans. So you have to really wonder what data are the, are the bankers looking at uh, and what uh, and how are they making their their decisions? So I think that's something we will come back to later in the conversation. And then to get to your your second point on the on the policy and why I was so pleased that um, Zia was on the the panel with us because universal ID is a, an issue that we see in all of the countries we're, work, we're working in. As more and more government services, financial services are moving into the digital realm, the fact that there are still a billion people without any ID, let alone a paper ID that doesn't, um, that, you know, that, that really isn't going to help them in the digital realm is becoming increasingly urgent that we address that issue and policymakers can make that um, can make that a, a, a very high priority. Um, there's also uh, the, something that we've seen in, in many countries, including Nigeria, having a national financial inclusion strategy is a fabulous first step. But in so many places, in India and in Indonesia, for example, we really only saw big progress made against that strategy when we started to see resources put behind that and the kinds of partnerships that we're going to have to see between public and private um, sectors in order to really make that strategy a reality. Well, thank you very much for that um, insightful response, Mary Ellen. And there's some questions I have on the back of the comments you made, but I think what I'd like to do um, very quickly is summarize some of the highlights of what you said. So first, you agree that the behaviors, or you've confirmed that the behaviors are similar across geographies, right? And women are less confident, so the, there's a lack of agency um, within the women to actually take action, right? And also, it's important to design for purpose. So design those resources that they'll use so that the, the people we are targeting are able to use them. And there's a need for digital literacy, I believe, is what you also alluded to. And finally, um, the financial service providers still don't see the business case. They have the data, and they're still not using it to make the decisions. And so I guess the... the the um, ask is that financial service providers, please use this data. It's a lot of work to actually get all of this data and for it not to be, like I mentioned earlier, the data is only as good as what it is used for. So thank you very much. So um, I'll bring it from a global lens to Nigeria. And um, I have Zayed Siga, <laughs> the Executive Secretary of the Kaduna State Residence Identity Management Agency, to talk from uh, a regional lens in terms of the northwest and northeast that we're seeing uh, the most excluded um, regions in, in Nigeria. So Zayed, through your lens as a northerner and as a state actor in the north, can you speak to the nuanced drivers of the high exclusion in the northwest and northeast that we're seeing? So I think the northwest is about 47% um, in the 2023 surveys and 38% in the northeast, much higher than the national average of 26%. Um, so thank you very much. Um, 
I think it comes down to two things. There are socioeconomic factors and also there are geographical factors that are different across the geopolitical zones of Nigeria. Um, so, for example, what I mean by that is the size of the states in the northwest and the northeast are quite, are quite large, uh, especially in comparison to other regions of the, of the country. Uh, just for context, um, Kaduna State, if you, if you take Kaduna State and place it in the southwest, uh, it would cover about 60% of the southwest. And if you go to the southeast, if you take Borno State, for example, I think it covers pretty much the entire southwest of Nigeria. So the states are quite geographically very, very large. And of course, that explains why uh, the number of physical bank branches that we have uh, are very limited. In the case of Kaduna State, I know previously, um, some years back, we had about 12 out of 23 local governments that did not have a physical bank branch. Um, that is down now to about seven or eight, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, when you have large um, geography like that, um, you have other issues. For example, network connectivity is something that we, uh, we struggle with. There are many locations in each of these states that are blind spots where basically you don't have access to, to, to network and what have you. Then, of course, we also have the insecurity challenges in the north. Uh, both in the northwest and the northeast. Uh, we have terrorism and we have banditry. And of course, this makes it very, very difficult to provide services, um, well, traditional services in, in, in these locations as well. Um, there are, of course, also uh, religious and cultural factors that are at play as well. Um, uh, the region is mostly uh, Islamic, and of course, um, uh, there's a uh, certain people view banking as a very interest-heavy uh, sector, and of course that clashes with the Islamic principles. But of course, there's more uh, effort to improve uh, Sharia-compliant banking in this region, so of course that is also helping. And of course the large population is also a problem because uh, the literacy levels are quite poor. So it's difficult to, it's harder to provide education across this large, uh, large spaces to the number of people. And uh, of course, most of these people do not have an understanding of why it is important for them to get financially included. And I think that is where we have the most opportunity because I actually believe if we would actually sensitize these people well enough consistently, um, they would meet us halfway. At least they would meet us halfway. But of course, uh, we as a financial inclusion co um, community also have to do our own part to simplify um, the processes uh, for people to create accounts and engage with the formal sector as well. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Thanks, Zayed. So I noticed that you've mentioned that, first of all, is the size of the states, right? So because it's a large geographical size, that already sort of gives us... Um, it, it gives a sense that, no, no, I don't want to say masquerades and makes it look like you're not achieving, you're not achieving as other states are. So it's a size challenge, but then also the infrastructural gaps and insecurity challenges and low literacy levels. But you did speak about sociocultural norms, which is sort of what I, or most people usually think is one of the key dri um, drivers of exclusion in the North. Is this truly the case or is it just an assumption? Well, I mentioned a little bit about the issue of the Sharia compliance in terms of engaging with the formal sector. Okay. Um, but of course, I believe with more sensitization and actually uh, improving literacy, people would understand that actually there is a way to engage with this sector without actually uh, participating in any interest. And that aside, of course, um, there are also uh, social and cultural factors. For, for example, I know most of the rural communities are generally male-led. So decision-making uh, is usually left with the uh, male figureheads in the families. And of course, that is why you would see that the exclusion is higher with the females rather than, rather than the males as well. So how do you address that? And have you tried to address that in Kaduna State? Well, I think uh, a lot of effort has gone in, especially with the uh, social investment office that has tried to uh, basically show women that they can actually uh, you know, uh, speak up for themselves a little bit. And it's, uh, I think it's something that takes time. So sensitization. It's, uh, yeah. It's, so again, it comes back to sensitization. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to you know, uh, push harder. Wait, are you sensitizing the women or men and women? We combine both. Both. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Zaid. So I'll come to our regulator on the panel. Um, 
Hawa Wakili from the Nigerian Communications Commission. So we've heard Zaya talk about one of the key drivers of exclusion in the north, and it's that uh, digital infrastructure gap. I'd like you to, first of all, just talk to us about the NCC's plans to address the digital divide that we see, which the data has also um, highlighted, and to ensure that rural and underserved communities have access to the telecoms infrastructure necessary for financial inclusion. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I must commend EFINA for this survey. Uh, I believe that the outcome of this survey would definitely help all stakeholders, government and private uh, stakeholders, in decision-making and planning. So, um, well done. Um, NCC, as a telecoms regulator, it's very um, infrastructure provision of infrastructure is at the heart of what NCC does. So it's quite excited about providing infrastructure. So basically, as a telecoms regulator, the major responsibility for NCC is um, policy development, provision and expansion of secure infrastructure and ensuring robust, available, affordable, and accessible networks by service providers. So some of the tools that NCC uses to achieve that is through regulation, uh, through collaboration, and through outreaches. As we have mentioned uh, here, we have recognized that there is need for connectivity all over Nigeria. Yes, that is very essential. NCC recognizes that fact, and that is why it is very keen on ensuring that infrastructure, uh, robust infrastructure, is made readily available all over Nigeria. So in doing so, it relies heavily on the National Broadband Plan. There's a National Broadband Plan that is a five-year strategy for deploying broadband connectivity and uptake. So some of the targets, it has key targets, some of the targets in that broadband plan is to have 70% uh, broadband penetration by end of 2025. At the moment, there is, we are about 45%. Uh, percent. So, and then another target is to have 120,000 kilometers of fi um, fiber optics cable deployed all over Nigeria. And then at the moment, a uh, total of 68% has been deployed. Um, and then again, is to have one point of access, at least one point of access in each local government of Nigeria, in Nigeria. So that means 774 point of access in 774 local governments of Nigeria, at least. Again, one interesting um, target of that broadband plan is to have 100% of uncovered areas, unserved areas in Nigeria should be covered by 2025. So NCC is working seriously to ensure that it's able to achieve that so that we'll have the required connectivity that will bring about the required digital transformation in Nigeria. Another key uh, thing that the Commission is doing at the moment is through the Universal Service Provision Fund. There are lots of connectivity and access projects that are, have been going on and are going on. Uh, you can see it's evidence in the reduction in the number of unserved clusters that we have. Um, like two or three years back, the unserved clusters were over 200 uh, unserved clusters. As of 2022, when the last uh, study was done, it came down to 97 clusters. So that means there's reduction in the unserved uh, clusters in Nigeria. Also, we have a new, um, apart from the, um, the National Broadband Plan, LCC also is using the strategic blueprint of the new strategic blueprint that we have from the Ministry of Innovation, Communication, and Digital Economy. So one of the important pillars in that strategic blueprint is infrastructure, trying to ensure that by 2027, at least we have 97,000 kilometers of fiber being laid in Nigeria. So that is also a target that we are working towards to achieve by end of uh, 2027. 
So we also have so many access projects that the commission, you know, keeps trying to, 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 to do like the digital awareness projects and then the... Um, um, yes. Thank you. Um, All right. So I, you. I know that you're going into another question, but before you go into oh, that, um, okay. there's something I want to highlight. And okay. you've talked about the broadband, broadband plan that the NCC has. Yeah. And everything you've outlined, sound like, they sound like really grand and intentional plans. But I just want to understand um, what exactly is the challenge for the broadband penetration to rural communities specifically. You talk about unserved clusters. Yeah. Do I assume that the unserved clusters are the hard to reach communities or it's just locations across Nigeria that are yet to have that broadband penetration? They are actually locations around Nigeria. Okay. Uh, the drive to ensure that we are able to implement the broadband plan hasn't been without its own challenges. Okay. One of the major challenges is the issue of the right of way. So, exactly. yes, issue of right of way across Nigeria. So, uh, the, the commission has been working tirelessly. In 2022, it had an engagement, governor's forum engagement with the mm -hmm. governor so as to be able to bring the cost of right of way. As you might know, the official right, cost of right of way is supposed to be 145 naira per linear meter. However, we see some states charging as high as 9,000 per linear meter. So, that has, wow. of course, so that has been a major issue in ensuring that we're able to get that infrastructure in all those uh, places. As you might also be aware, we have licensed seven infrastructure companies that are supposed to do that. But this is one of the major issues aside from vandalization, aside from multiple taxation. Some companies are charged in a state with as high as 49 different taxes in a wow. state. So you can just see that is why it's debilitating. We are not able to reach to some of this, but the commission continues to work hard to ensure we collaborate with security, uh, you know, security um, outfits to ensure that we are able to reach those unserved areas, unserved and underserved areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hawa, for that clarification. And I hear you because I, I, I have heard that challenge of the right of way being one of the barriers. And I think that the, what the governor has highlighted in his pitch today is to move from collaboration to commitment. And we have somebody from the NGF here who's also on the technical, um, the technical group for the H2F service. I, I think you can take this message back as the secretariat of the Nigeria Governors Forum to see how we can collectively commit, not even just work together now, to, to um, removing these barriers that continue to um, deepen exclusion. So I will come back to Mary Ellen. Mary, so I wanted you to just also um, talk about from, from different experiences and your learnings, how can we ensure that financial products and services are tailored to the diverse financial needs and risk appetite of low-income women? Yeah, that's at the, at the heart of our work, so thank you so much for, for asking about it. And I was really struck by how many of the results that were shown this morning just sync up so closely with the work that we're doing um, that, that maybe I'll tell a story about some work that we're doing um, in, in India right now um, because I, it really was so aligned with uh, many of the um, A to F results. So Women's World Banking is a huge proponent of something we call women-centered design. So really making sure that we first listen to women, talk to women, hear what the pain points, what the preferences, what the issues they're having with a product are, and then designing around those. So in India, as many of you may know, they, they had, have had a very, very um, concerted push towards financial inclusion at many, many levels, from digital physical in, uh, public infrastructure, as well as um, close coordination with the, the banking sector. Um, and there was a sort of no-frills bank account that millions and millions of uh, low-income Indians opened. But not long after um, the, all the excitement and hoopla around opening the accounts, it became evident that people really weren't seeing them as entirely relevant to their lives. And there was some fairly significant dormancy amongst those accounts. 
even higher amongst women. 55% of the accounts held by women were not being used on a regular basis. So Women's World Banking was brought in by one of the largest state-owned banks that had about 15% of the market of those no-frills accounts. And we talked to women who had these accounts, and we heard a really consistent story from them that, and again, we saw this in the Athena data, they didn't think they had enough money to really engage with a bank. They didn't think the bank was really for them. A bank is for rich people. They didn't think that the small, small amounts that they would be depositing on a weekly or a monthly basis were something that the bank would want. What, what they didn't know is that's exactly what the bank wanted and that even a relatively small um, but regular deposit would cover the cost of the banks maintaining those accounts. So we designed an account that said, if you make six deposits over a set period of time that you commit to, at the end of that period of time, you'll be eligible for an emergency credit line of about a hundred and it was about a hundred and twenty dollar um, equivalent. One of the other things that I that really leaped out at me with the data this morning that I wanted to to talk about is one of the ways that we worked with the women to convince them that the bank was for them. So it's not just that they wanted that small deposit, but we found that they really built trust much better with women agents. So I was very excited to see that there is such a predominance of agents, and that's been a big development since 2020. But the use of women agents has been less of a priority here in Nigeria, and we're seeing tremendous results. In this bank that I was telling you about in India, we saw women agents having better rates of sign up for the product, both with men and women, better rates of conversion from the signing to the actual, you know, depositing, opening and depositing of the account than male agents. Higher balances were maintained by the women agents. Where there were loans, where they had taken that emergency loan, they had better repayment rates. Again, both men and women clients where the account was managed by a woman agent. And then this was really exciting as well from that business case that we're trying to establish is they had better cross-sell rates to a, an insurance product that was also, they were also eligible for, um, for receiving. Again, both men and women, those women agents were really, really delivering superior financial performance. And then there's just one other thing that I think is so critical in these times that we're living in, where climate is affecting every element of our lives. We're seeing, including here in, in Nigeria, huge displaced populations because of, uh, be, because of climate change. One of the areas that we had the biggest rollout of this product was a very rural area in the state of Uttar Pradesh that had quite severe floods earlier this year. And we saw some really distinct differences in the women and, and men farmers that had taken this product. They were able to draw on that emergency line of credit. They were able to keep their kids in school. More members of the family were eating three meals a day, and they were able to replant much more quickly than the families that didn't have the account. And the word of mouth to the families that didn't have the account went through the roof, and we saw sign-up rates following the flood um, really, really increase. So being gender intentional about the way you design your product is really good business. Brilliant. It's, and it's true what the late Kofi Annan said that, you know, when women thrive, all of society is better for it. And that's essentially what you've demonstrated. And one of my key takeouts from this, and if I were to sort of wrap all of that up, is to say that women can be incentivized by um, credit products because that's like a primary need. So they may not feel that they have the funds to, to have a bank account, but if they have the understanding through education to know that you can do this to get your primary need, which is access to credit, then you're, you're um, basically on your way to financial inclusion. Thank you very much for that, Mary Ellen. So I'll come back to you, Zayed. And this is a personal favorite, as you know. Um, Kaduna has been doing a lot of work, especially under your leadership, around ID ownership. And the campaign that Inclusion for All has been doing has been around access to ID for the most excluded groups are likely to be women in rural communities, farmers in the north. Um, we know that ID is a fundamental enabler for financial inclusion. And what that basically means is if today we wanted to bank um, all the people in a particular community, the 
place to start is the IG, otherwise we can't even start that process. Can you just speak very quickly to the Kaduna State ID journey and how it has catalyzed financial inclusion? Um, thank you very much. Um, well, Kaduna State uh, started its digital ID journey as far back as 2015. Of course, um, uh, this has been done in collaboration with the NIMC, right? Um, so initially, we were just supporting them to make sure more people, more residents of Kaduna were getting registered, you know, uh, procuring um, biometric equipment, uh, recruiting staff to work with them to fast track, fast track the work. And then, of course, later on, I think in 2018, Kadrima was then established to coordinate this relationship and also establish the database of the Kaduna State residents. And of course, this was a conscious effort by the then governor because, of course, he realized that uh, ID affects a lot of things. Right? It affects a lot of things. And in his own words, he always said, you cannot govern people that you don't know. And of course, um, he kept saying, without ID, we can't do financial inclusion. We can't do social protection. We can't improve service delivery. Um, you can't even address issues like inequality and gender, gender equality without a uh, digital ID database. And of course, from the financial inclusion angle, uh, going back to the 2020 survey, uh, especially the deep dive that, that was done in, in Kaduna State, uh, I think 70% of the respondents at the time indicated that uh, the lack of identification documents was their most significant challenge in getting bank accounts. And of course, this was all the motivation we needed to uh, improve digital ID registrations in Kaduna. Between then and now, I think digital ID coverage in Kaduna State has improved from about 23% to about 70% in three years. Um, of course, this is a long-term investment that we hope will keep on uh, facilitating financial inclusion indices. But interestingly, as the digital ID registrations are increasing, not just in Kaduna, but also in Nigeria, the number of bank accounts are not increasing as fast as they are. So there's definitely a missing link that we also need to sit together and try to find a way around. Thank you. Thank you, Zayed. And so how can other states in the Northwest learn from Kaduna State's um, experience, or how are you working with other states in the Northwest? Um, we are always open to collaboration, and many, many states have come to us for peer learning, but uh, there was a, a playbook that was launched recently on the Kaduna State experience, and I think it's available online. Um, any questions, you can just visit the Kadrima website, and I'm sure all the resources will be there. But of course, uh, we remain happy to engage any organization that's interested and to guide as well. Fantastic. We're moving from collaboration to commitment. Zaid has committed to, to, <laughs> to, to providing lessons to states that are interested. Fantastic. I know I'm mindful of the time. We have about five minutes. And would I also like to include our audience in the room and online. So I think I'll make some time very quickly to ask questions from the audience from, for any of the panelists. Do we have any questions? If you can just indicate by raising your hand. Okay, I have a gentleman on that table. Um, Uti, there's someone that has a question. We have the... Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my question is for NCC, especially around the National Broadband Plan. So I would like to ask, how is the progress of the, MB, uh, the National Broadband Plan being tracked? And then also, what is the level of progress mm -hmm. made? And Sorry, um, could you speak up, please? We still can't hear you. And if you can introduce yourself as also, we know who's asking the question. All right, sorry. Uh, my name is Saheed Saliu, a consultant with DevAfric Development Advisor. All right, so my question goes to NCC on the National Broadband Plan. How uh, you've uh, stated or, uh, the, what the National Broadband Plan has to achieve with by 2025, that's 70% penetration, 120,000 fiber cable network, and 774 access point. So this is 2023. How is the progress being tracked? And is there a data visualization platform where interested public or population, um, I mean Nigerians can view what is going on, how this progress is being achieved. And then also, is there a plan to, what is the level of progress so far and what are the plans to close the gap 
to ensure that, yes, by 2025, we achieve all what the National Broadband Plan has set to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, as far as NCC is concerned, I think there is no cause for alarm. The plan is on course. As you can see, the target by 2025 for the broadband uh, uh, deployment is 120,000. At the moment, we are kind of halfway, and the achievement is also, you know, more than 50% of that target has been achieved. And also, as it relates to the broadband penetration, the target is 70% by 2025. At the moment, we are almost 50 uh, you know, so we, we are on target. And we are particularly not concerned, more so that the previous target that had 30% uh, at the end of 2018, at the end of, at the end of the tenure of that plan, we had surpassed the target of 30%. We, it was at 31%. So, and it has key performance indicators, it has timelines, so we continue to ensure that we work with that. And also, the national digital economy policy and strategy that we're also using is helping to augment, you know, the plan. And we also have a big committee, a chairing committee, national committee, that is also working to ensure that that plan, the target content in that plan, is being made as planned. We also have, you can also, just like I said, the new minister, uh, there, is also, there is a new strategic blueprint that has even another target. So all stakeholders are working to ensure that target, that target that we have put in the National Broadband Plan is uh, being met. And then one of the ways, again, we want to ensure that we achieve that target is through the infra cost that I talked about. So we are reviewing some of the terms and conditions of the um, infra cost, the infrastructure companies, so to ensure that we are able to target on viable areas so that all the unserved and underserved areas of Nigeria will be covered and, um, and so many other initiatives that are being put in place to ensure that that target is met. So I think we are fine on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hawa. And I, I hope that answers your question. I have one more hand up and it will be the last question because we're now actually running out of time. All right. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. My name is Kunle Oreagba from Solina. And my question is around how we are leveraging opportunities in other sectors to really financially include women. For instance, in area of health like immunization, we've seen that women-led group like body groups has been used to improve uptake of immunization. So these groups are there. How are we leveraging working with this sector to leverage these groups in driving access to uh, financial services for women? Uh, just to be clear, your question is how can we use financial inclusion to drive access in other sectors? My question is how can we use some existing platforms in other sectors like health okay. in driving financial inclusion for women? Okay. Who would yeah. you like to answer that? Mary, would you try to answer that? Thank you. It, it's an interesting kind of reversal of the way we often think about it. How can we use financial inclusion to further... Um, to further health goals, so I, I, I like the way you're thinking about it, and I also think health is the, you know, is the point. We see so often, you know, women will never think of their own health except during the, the period of time that they're pregnant. They're always going to be concerned and make certain decisions around their children's health and making choices for their children. So we we very much see that as a as a as a linkage perhaps to building trust if you establish trust with a woman that you're a financial institution that that cares about the things that she cares about that can be a tremendous um point of entry or uh, gateway to um offering her financial services about the things that she really cares about thank you very much marilyn and um we're essentially out of time, but I think that there's one thing that we must do on this panel session, and it's to get a recommendation. And Mary, this question will come back to you, and it will just be if you were to give one recommendation to the policymakers um, in a few seconds, like 30 seconds, what would that be? Yes. I didn't get your question. Okay. Um, so, Mary, that was directed to you, but okay. you, yes. I, yes, yes. I thought it was for, for all of us. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to go back to gender segregated data. Do it, report on it, 
do it at the product level, and then use it to make business decisions. And they'll be better decisions, and they'll make money doing so. Awesome. Thank you very much. Zad, do you have any last words, comments? Uh, just writing off what she said, I think um, a lot of the effort to drive financial inclusion still is mostly at the state level. And I would like to see a more coordinated effort at the central, at the federal government, with actual KPIs and timelines towards actually delivering these targets. And how do you recommend that we do that? Uh, it's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. How are Yes. Last words? So my last words would be to emphasize on collaboration. Okay. I think collaboration amongst all key, key stakeholders is quite important. We can see the outcome, one of the outcomes of this survey indicates that what has, we have been doing is working. So that means, and is as a result of collaboration between all stakeholders. So it's important that we continue to collaborate, most especially between the telecom sector regulator and the financial sector regulator. We can see that the regulatory lines are diminishing. It is very, very important that we come together, most especially that we're seeing convergence and we collaborate. Also, the private sector is very important that we collaborate. I think we cannot over-collaborate, but we can under-collaborate. So collaboration is key to achieving the financial inclusion targets that we are set out, set out for this country. Thank you. Fantastic. As you can, the response from, from the audience, they're clapping. Indeed, collaboration is critical. And just to re-echo the um, governor's statement about collaboration and commitment, it's one thing to collaborate, it's another thing to be committed to that collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, Hi, you Chinasa. will. Hi, sir. Apologies, I'm on your left. Hello. Sorry to interrupt. I promised the online audience that they would be included in the experience. Do we have time? So we have, we have time. As the time moderator, we have time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first and foremost, we have um, one question from um, the audience online. And it says, my question goes to the male panelists on the roles and challenges of fintech in marginalized areas of northwest and northeast Nigeria. So that's for Zayed. Can you, can you repeat that question? So it says, um, my question goes to the male panelists on the roles and challenges of fintech in marginalized areas of northwest and northeast Nigeria? Well, I think the fintechs actually uh, are doing the most work in actually getting to those rural communities at the moment. Because if you look at it, the banks themselves um, look at it as a business case, right? And it is not profitable for them to actually put physical bank branches out there. So they are looking at innovative solutions, mostly led by the fintechs to actually do that. Uh, what I think I, we need to do a little bit more is um, maybe go the uh, DPI approach, perhaps. Um, let us have a system that brings together the digital ID system, a data exchange system, and payment systems together. And with that, we can actually quickly um, improve on uh, accounts and, and, and access to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zaid, and I hope that the person asking the question was satisfied with your response. I understand that we have one more question from the room. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All I right. I'm over here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, just to track back a bit, um, between, my name is Lennox. I'm representing Kudi Mata. My GMD, she just stepped out. She's quite strong. So in recent times, in collaborating with NNPC Academy and the foundation and NYSC, we've recently just trained about 300,000 graduates across Nigeria in basic financial literacy. Okay, and one of the things we have observed from the also analysis working with Elfina's data, all right, is that one um, question to NCC, um, coppers always complain about network in camps. So, um, yeah, it's been a challenge, and the foundation or the academy would not want to invest so much money giving data to over 300,000 graduates across Nigeria because they are also trained digitally. Also, one thing we've also done is try to record these trainings, the financial literacy trainings and materials, yet you hear complaints about issues of download, in costs for data, costs for... 
um, watching all of this. Uh, so it's, it's a major challenge. Now the question is, how can we currently, like she also mentioned, collaborate further with institutions like NCC to further see how um, the network providers can actually subsidize areas that has to do with data and all of this to further enhance trainings from such organizations. Thank you very much. All right. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I can tell you that NCC has a lot of connectivity projects in almost all the schools and universities or higher institutions in Nigeria uh, because of some of these issues. And again, one of the targets in the National Broadband Plan, you know, is to have data to uh, come down to 390 naira per gigabit. You know, so NCC is working on that. It's one of the targets to be achieved because, of course, NCC is concerned with the issue of affordability because if we need to achieve this inclusion or financial inclusion in Nigeria, it boils down to economic inclusion. So that is also at the front burner of what NCC is doing. Again, there are lots of outreaches that NCC, quite often you find out that it boils down to lack of education or understanding or literacy as was mentioned or identified in the in the survey that was done so ncc has does a lot of outreach programs a lot of uh, education to consumers so as to, to to take advantage of some of these things and then the 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 service providers also do a lot of interventions that target that. So it's a work in progress, actually. I would, I would like to refer to something that's quite interesting. There was a, a, a survey, a study that was done by GSME. The study is as recent as October this year. So one of the outcomes is, a, is an African study, anyway, regarding the universal service provision uh, access or gaps in Africa. So it was discovered that, uh, well, it goes back to corroborate what has been there anyway. It's not so much of as it is right now, it's not so much of the access gap, but usage and adoption. And it boils down to that understanding, that awareness, that education for Nigerian citizens to know what is available, how to take advantage of what is available. So NCC has also recognized that far, and it is carrying along connectivity uh, in some of the, 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 the projects and interventions that it has. So it's a work in progress. Thank you. Thank you, Hawa, and I hope that answered your question. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions, but I'm assuming there are no other questions. And in the absence of any additional questions, I would like to bring this session to an end. And I think that you can agree with me that this has been an illuminating conversation with our eminent panelists, just you know, sharing from their lens and talking about the things that we can do to advance financial inclusion in Nigeria. I do hope that we can all leave here backing our feelings with data and collectively work towards you know, driving an inclusive Nigeria. Thank you very much. Can I Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chinasa. We're going to be taking some pictures now, so if you could just stand. Thank you.